Well, thank you for coming. It's always a pleasure. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's always a pleasure to be back at PITP. Uh, we have a diverse audience here as far as the background, which makes the giving such a talk particularly challenging because I'll clearly tell things that are too elementary for some of you, and at some point there will be things that are too advanced. And so the way I structured it, it would be I kind of ramp the level up, talking first about really ancient things and gradually move to things that are more modern. Now, some of you have recognized the faces, have heard me during the last year giving very similar talks, and I'm recycling these talks, so I apologize to them. And I noticed some people in the audience who have actually heard very similar talks 20 years ago, so I also apologize to them. <laughs> uh, as far as references, I'll try to construct it in a somewhat pedagogical way, and references will kind of distract the flow so I'll give references now, and from this moment on, there will be no references. And references can be found in, in the papers. I'll refer to two review articles that I wrote, which have many references, both within Trilligator, one in 95 and one in 07. Just cook, uh, aspire them, and you will find the references. And I more or less follow the second of them here, the second review, uh, for the first and a half lecture, and then later I'll talk about more modern things and I'll give references there. I'd like to summarize first what I'll say now is two lines so that it will be easy to remember. So it'll be two points which are really the summary and the takeaway lesson from these lectures. And the rest will be kind of details that we'll fill in. So the first thing is that in supersymmetric theories, some objects can be computed exactly, and that gives us a powerful tool to learn about these theories. And that comes in the literature on the various different names. Uh, the name I'll emphasize here is holomorphy, but other names which really capture the same idea are, and I made just this partial list here, BPS, localization, index, chiral quantities, topological quantities, and the list goes on and on. The main point is that these are special quantities that are invariant under some subset of the supersymmetries in the problem, and that gives us a powerful tool to constrain them exactly. So this is lesson number one. In supersymmetric theories, some but not all quantities can be computed exactly. And the second lesson is the fundamental role of duality, especially electric magnetic duality and its various relatives, and again, it comes under different names, for example, mirror symmetry. These principles seem to be these phenomena seem to be ubiquitous, and these principles seem to control the dynamics in a vast variety of examples. So I'll give here some examples, which are somewhat characteristic, and from other lecturers you will see other examples, but it's good to keep that in mind that it's basically the same principle, basically the same uh, idea. So these are the two lessons. Some things can be computed exactly. Hopefully we can learn about more generic things just by staring at these objects. And the second is the role of duality. Now, before I really start with the lecture, I really, really want to encourage you to ask questions as I speak. Don't wait till the end. Don't be embarrassed, especially because the audience is so diverse. I have no idea how high I pitch these lectures and what your background is. So please, please, please interrupt me with questions, and I'll be more than happy to answer. I guess so far there aren't any questions. Okay, so I'm going to assume some initial conditions that all of you are familiar with Wes and Bagger, and, but I'm not going to assume anything beyond Wes and Bagger. Is this a valid assumption? Okay, three people nodded, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start with a scalar field theory or a chiral field theory, and that's known as the West Zumino model. And I'll be in four dimensions to be specific, but that's not important. There is a Keller potential, which is phi absolute value square. Phi is a chiral superfield. And there is a super potential, W, which is M phi square plus, is this big enough? Yeah. Is this big enough also for the overflow? Good. Good. 
So this is the super potential. This is kind of the canonical structure. In four dimensions, such theory does not really exist because it is infrared free, so it's not a valid interacting quantum field theory. But in lower dimensions it is, say in three or two dimensions. And, but as far as what I'm going to say to now, it's not going to matter and we can just stick with this theory. So this theory can be analyzed by considering two U1 symmetries, global U1 symmetries. An ordinary U1 symmetry and an R symmetry. An R symmetry is defined as a symmetry that does not commute with supersymmetry. And in my convention, the supercharge has charge one. And we have a superfield phi, and without loss of generality, we'll give charge one here and one here. Now, this is clearly not a symmetry of the problem, because if we rotate phi by a phase, you see the superpotential is not invariant. So we are going to compensate for it by assigning charges to M, so I'll put minus two here, and to G, minus three here. And with the R charges, my convention is such that the superpotential carries R charge two, so I'll just balance the charges, and you see that I put one here, so we have phi squared, that's two, so I'll balance the charges by putting zero here. And here I have to ba can balance the charges by putting minus one. Now, what have I done here? I've used a symmetry that doesn't exist. This is not a symmetry of the problem. But I'm going to think of M and G, these coupling constant, as big background fields. And as background fields, we can assign to them transformation laws under the symmetries. This is very common in physics, to use symmetries that are explicitly broken. We rotate the parameters. Can, if they let the parameters rotate as well as the fields, the it is as if the symmetry is there. And this is very common both in classical mechanics and in quantum mechanics. We don't need to go to quantum field theory for this. And it gives us typically selection rules for various observables. Because if we, we can control the dependence on the coupling constant by employing these symmetries. And we'll soon see how we can do that. Yes? Would you give an example for classical physics, classical mechanics? Same thing. A, a specific puzzle. Just take some differential equation, <laughs> do the same thing. Ah, the question was if I can give an example in classical mechanics, and I said yes, any differential equation. Uh, if you have a complex variable, we can rotate the complex variable by a phase, even though the, the differential equation is not invariant, if we allow the parameters in the differential equation rotate in an, in an appropriate way, and then the solution will respect that symmetry. And this is being used uh, all over. So the dynamics now can now be controlled by using three principles. And what I'm going to emphasize is the principle I'll refer to as the no miracles or the no magic principle. And the principle states that we have very simple criteria to constrain the dynamics. And the no miracle statement is that whatever is consistent with that symmetry is allowed. This is a variant of a statement that is common in quantum field theory in general, that whatever is not explicitly forbidden is allowed. This is an old, well-known principle in quantum field theory. If a term can be generated, it will be generated. So we'll do the same thing here, except that the rules will be slightly modified, and I'll still stick to the same principle. So the rules are, first of all, symmetries. And second, supersymmetry. And in this case, in particular, we'd like to say that W is holomorphic. So if you look at Wes and Bagger, W depends only on chiral superfields and not on anti-chiral superfields. And when we compute a quantity like W, like the superpotential, it should remain holomorphic. And I'm going to extend these two ideas slightly by using these symmetries that don't exist. So I'm going to use these symmetries to control the answers. And since they are not real symmetries, we have to let M and G rotate under them and impose the symmetry when we also rotate M and G appropriately. The same can be said 
for the holomorphic dependence. We can think of M and G as being background fields. This is done, for example, in the hydrogen atom. We put it in the magnetic field, in the background magnetic field, and we get selection rule. We get the Zeeman effect, and we get some selection rules about transitions and so forth. The same thing we can do here by saying that M and G are background fields. This means that we can let them depend on X in a way with very, very long wavelength. So we can let M and G be functions of X in a different point in space. We have somewhat different values. And when we compute the effective Lagrangian, we would like these to, to be some Lagrangian for these background fields. But since we're doing supersymmetry, we can let them depend not only on X, but they can also depend on theta. And therefore, we should think of M and G as being chiral superfields. So the original Lagrangian, the original superpotential, depends on dynamical fields phi and background super chiral superfields M and G. And therefore, W should be holomorphic both in fields and in coupling constants. Is there any way to lower the temperature here? Okay. Is there any way to lower the temperature? I'm sweating here. It's already down to 60. But that's not gotten there yet. It's getting there. Ah, thank you. And the third principle I'll use is various limits where we know what the answer is. And I claim that that's all there is. If we use the standard rules of quantum field theory, supplemented by these, we can always get the exact answer. And every term that passes these criteria not only can be generated, but will be generated. So let's see how it works in practice. So we started with some tree-level superpotential, W, and we want to compute an effective superpotential. And it should be a holomorphic function of phi, m, and g. And in particular, no phi bar, no m bar, and no g bar. So using the symmetries, we can constrain it quite a lot, and we can write it as m phi square. This is clearly an allowed term because it already appears at tree level, times an arbitrary function of a variable I'll call t, which is g phi over m. Notice that G phi over M, this combination carries no charges under the two U1 symmetries. So the principle of symmetries is not going to tell me anything beyond that. So we reduced everything instead of being an arbitrary function of three variables. Now we have to determine a function of one variable. This is where we use two symmetries. So we had three variables, two symmetries, and therefore there's only one unknown function. Well, we actually know something about this function. Because when g is very small, perturbation theory is valid, and we should recover more or less what we started with. And there could be higher order corrections. So that's the limit of small g. So here we use the symmetries. And here we use small g. And indeed, there could be higher order terms. Nothing stops us from adding higher order terms. So let's examine where these other higher order terms could come from. One term we can get is, say, t to the n. So that would give us term like m phi square times g to the n, phi to the n over m to the n. And such a term can indeed be generated by a diagram by a diagram like that. So such a diagram exists, and such a diagram indeed leads to such a correction. 
to the superpotential. There are several things that are wrong with this diagram, and they're all equivalent. First of all, it's not one PI. If we cut the diagram here in the middle, see, we separate the diagram to two separate diagrams. So if we are computing the one PI effective action, and I assume you'll learn that in your quantum field theory course, then such a term should not be included because it's not one PI. Another way of saying it is that we can think of this Lagrangian as being a Wilsonian Lagrangian, obtained by integrating out all the massive degrees of freedom, all the high energy modes, and finding an effective Lagrangian for the light modes. In such effective Lagrangian, we should not include the low momentum processes. The process, the idea of separating, of writing the Wilsonian effective action is that we separate the modes into high energy modes that we integrate out and low energy modes that we still keep in the Lagrangian. So such a diagram, you can think of pi's as having zero momentum, there's zero momentum flowing in this line. And since there's zero momentum flowing in this line, it, this is only a zero momentum process and therefore it shouldn't contribute to the Wilsonian action. So such a term really cannot exist. What about loop diagrams? See, if I only add one more line here, say here, with two Gs here, now the diagram is one particle irreducible, so maybe we should include it. And indeed, there is such a diagram, and it's non-zero, and it contributes to something. But the point is that it cannot contribute to this object. Because the number of phi's in this diagram is exactly the same as it was before. I didn't change the number of phi's. I added two vertices, one here and one here, and each vertex comes with a factor of t, of, sorry, with a fac factor of g. So this general structure where we have an arbitrary function of g phi over m is not respected by this diagram. So such a diagram exists, and it contributes to the effective Lagrangian, but it cannot contribute to the superpotential. So putting all these together, we derive a known result. That's known as a non-renormalization theorem. So the theory can be very complicated. We have a lot of complicated dynamics, but all of it comes in the effective Cayley potential or maybe in higher derivative terms, but not in the superpotential. So once we have such a result, we'd like to have consequences, so I'm going to make a list of comments that are somewhat independent. First of all, I proved it here for a cubic superpotential with one superfield. It's straightforward, and I'll give it as an exercise for you to extend this proof to any number of fields and any polynomial superpotential. In fact, it doesn't even have to be polynomial, but just do it for a polynomial. So consider a superpotential which has n fields, and some, super, and some polynomial in these fields and show that the same result is true. You will have to work a little bit harder because there are more coupling constants and you have to take various limits, but it's still true. So this is comment number one. Comment number two, if we have both light fields and heavy fields, we might want to integrate out the heavy fields and not have them in the effective Lagrangian. In this case, we should include such three diagrams so this is a light field, this is a light field, and imagine that this is a heavy field. Such a diagram is one particle reducible, but if we integrate out H, or if we think of the problem as being an effective Lagrangian below the mass of H, we should integrate out H, and then such a diagram does exist, and it does contribute to the superpotential, and it leads to a term of order L to the fourth. So when you hear that the superpotential is exactly the three-level superpotential, or what appears in the Lagrangian, that's somewhat imprecise because integrating out massive fields can renormalize the superpotential. Now, we, I did not say anything about the number of dimensions here. We can say the same thing in three dimensions and in two dimensions, in one dimension, 
and the proof is exactly the same. Now, I also use perturbation theory in telling, uh, giving an interpretation for these terms, but it's clear that the same answer is valid even non-perturbatively. Imagine there are some non-perturbative effects in G that would still respect the same rules, and they still cannot correct the superpotential. Now, in four dimensions, this is not a very interesting statement because this theory doesn't really strictly exist. But in lower dimensions, say in three dimensions, it exists. And the fact that the statement is true non-perturbatively is interesting and useful. Later, we will see that this statement is that the superpotential is not corrected is not strictly true once we include non-perturbative effects. The way it will come about is that we'll use symmetries that are true in perturbation theory, and therefore they can constrain the superpotential. But these symmetries will cease to be exact beyond perturbation theory, and therefore beyond perturbation theory, new terms can appear in the Lagrangian, terms that violate this symmetry that existed classically in perturbation theory, and by doing that, the theorem will still be true in a broader sense. In other words, when I claim the no, ma no magic principle, that these three ideas control everything, if in perturbation theory we have more symmetries, in perturbation theory we have fewer allowed terms. Non-perturbatively, we have fewer symmetries, and therefore we can allow more terms, and we will see this no magic principle. Once the terms are allowed, they are generated, and they are indeed there. Now, the main thing that really made this result work is the holomorphy. Because if I only could allow here a G star, the complex conjugate of G, there would be many other invariants I could have written down, like any function of G, G star. There would be other invariants, and then there could be a whole power series in G, G star multiplying every one of these terms. So that would have been possible. So the main idea here <laughs> is that the superpotential is holomorphic in G, and that is this thing I said earlier, that the same principle appears in more modern applications like localization and looking at controlling BPS objects that are invariant under half supersymmetries, computing chiral quantities, and so forth. So there's a long list of things that really follow from the same idea that some objects are invariant under the under half of supersymmetries. So this would be an actual place to stop for questions. Yes, please. Uh, so the question was about the dependence on renormalization scheme. So what I'm going to assume here is that there exists a supersymmetric regularization scheme. In this particular case, we can easily do it. We just take, say, pauli villas And throughout the lectures, I'm going to assume that there is a regularization scheme. And later, I will even say specifically which regularization scheme I have in mind. But for this discussion, it, it it doesn't matter. So thank you for the question. Any more questions? So the next topic I'd like to discuss is gauge theories. So the next topic I'd like to discuss is gauge theories. And I'm going to discuss an SUN gauge theory. We can generalize that to SON, SPN, exceptional groups, whatever you. And with matter field, just in the fundamental representation to make it easy. So it's a lot like QCD, the theory of the strong interactions. And I'm going to start easy with a pure SUN gauge theory. And by pure, I mean no matter. And I'll be in four dimensions. So. So this theory has gluons, a mu, and gluinos, lambda alpha. And we can form one gauge invariant combination of these superfields using Wessenbagger notation. I'll call it S. For convenience, I put a minus 32 pi square here, which is not that crucial. Trace W alpha square. So this is a chiral superfield appearing in Wesson Bagger, and I assume that you know about Wesson Bagger. And this is a chiral superfield S. And in components, it's 1 over 32 pi square, trace lambda lambda, 
plus all sorts of other terms. Among them, F mu nu square. So the Lagrangian So the Lagrangian includes all sorts of terms plus integral d2 theta of this s with a coefficient 1 over g squared, and there might be a prefactor plus complex conjugate. And I can also make, replace this 1 over g squared by a complex number. I'll call it tau. And tau will be theta over 2 pi plus, what's the coefficient of g? With the prefactor that I will get straight through. So this theta is the same as the QCD theta angle and multiplies the topological charge. And this is the gauge coupling constant. And they appear together in this combination. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is really extremely unfortunate and too late to change it. This theta is anti-commuting coordinate, and this theta is the vacuum angle. And I hope it will not be confusing which of which I'm using. I can, if I could write tech here, I'll use theta and var theta, for example, but uh, I can't do it here. Does this answer your question? Who, who asked me the question? Somebody in the back. Yes. Good. So thank you for pointing this out. So we are going to use the same principles, and we always start with our little table, and the table of charges. And this problem has one symmetry. It's an R symmetry. It's a symmetry that does not commute with supersymmetry. So the gluon is clearly neutral. And the gluino carries charge one. And therefore, S carries charge 2 because it's made out of two gluinos. Now, this symmetry is exact in perturbation theory. It's the symmetry of the Lagrangian. It, exact, it is exact in perturbation theory. If you compute correlation functions in perturbation theory, this symmetry is respected. But it's going to be violated non-perturbatively. So let me say a few words about that. This theory is asymptotically free which means that we formulated a short distance with some small coupling constant, g at the level of the, at the value of the, g at the cutoff. And with some lambda cutoff. And then as we go to lower energies, which means that we integrate out modes by lowering the value of the cutoff, we get some strong dynamics. This is the phenomenon of asymptotic freedom. And I'm going to represent it in the following way, which is not the traditional one. So I'll call that M, not the not. Now, you have probably seen this formula before, but you have seen it by seeing the logarithm of this formula. It's usually written as the logarithm of this formula. And what it means is that we hold the cutoff, we have a cutoff, and we have a coupling constant at the level of the cutoff. And now the, cu the coupling starts running, and a phenomenon known as dimensional transmutation takes place. And dimensional transmutation is the phenomenon that G cutoff is arbitrary, and M cutoff is arbitrary. We can f regularize the theory any way we want, at any scale we want. 
But out of these two quantities, only this low energy scale lambda is meaningful and that's what the physics depends on. So in QCD, this is several hundred MeV. G is not discussed and it depends on how you regularize the theory and so forth. Lambda is more meaningful. There is some freedom in how you define lambda, which I'll talk about later. And it's convenient to define this quantity eta that appears here. Now, I've said that the coupling constant of the theory is really a complex number tau, and I'll introduce it here by adding here i theta. So the whole exponent here will be e to the 2 pi i tau. So this thing is this. So there is one complex number. So unlike ordinary QCD, where this lambda is real, here this lambda will be a complex number, a complex number whose phase is the theta angle. And as you correctly pointed out, not to be confused with the anti-commuting theta. <coughs> now we look at the Lagrangian, and in the Lagrangian we see the tau and s appear here integrated d2 theta. This means that S is a chiral, we said that S is a chiral superfield, and therefore if we want to promote tau to a field, we should better also promote it to a chiral superfield. And therefore this eta, or this lambda, will be a chiral superfield. So this eta is a chiral superfield, and now we are in business to get our general machine going, because whenever we have chiral superfields, we can use our three rules to constrain what can possibly happen. So what is known about this theory? I've already said that it's formulated at short distance in the theory of gluons and gluinos. And then as we go to long distance, the coupling becomes strong, and a priori we know nothing. So I'm going to tell you now what the theory does without a proof, and later I'll actually give a proof of this statement. So the logic will be a little bit circular, but bear with me, I'll fill all the gaps, and the story can be told in a different order, but it will be more complicated. So again, I'm going to make an assumption now about this theory, an assumption that I will prove later, and then we'll be able to run the whole story backwards and derive this assumption. But for the moment, let's just make the assumption. And the assumption is that in the IR, the strong dynamics well that's not an assumption that's clear just from the one loop beta function but what's no, less trivial is that there is a gap which means that at long distance there is nothing no particles at long distance so the spectrum of the theory only glue balls And furthermore, there is chiral symmetry breaking. And I'm going to write the formula here. It's 1 over 32 pi square. And as before, I'm going to make a lot of comments about this. First of all, this looks a little bit puzzling. Because we say we have a U1R symmetry. There's an expectation value of something charged under the symmetry. And therefore, there should be a Goldstone boson. There should be a massless Goldstone boson. And yet, I said that there is a gap and there are no massless particles. The answer to that is that this symmetry, this U1R symmetry, is an exact symmetry in the, of the classical Lagrangian. It's also exact in perturbation theory, but it's not exact in the full theory. More specifically, the U1R symmetry is explicitly broken to 
equals z to nc. I have z and nc colors. So let me call it everywhere nc, because this will be important later. This thing can be seen, a, a precursor of this can be seen already in perturbation theory. At one loop, the current, the conserved current, is not exact, is not conserved. There is a term on the right-hand side known as the anomaly, proportional to F wedge F. Have you heard about that? Okay. That by itself does not invalidate the symmetry in perturbation theory. Non-perturbatively, there are configurations in the functional integral called instantons. And instantons break the symmetry. Every instanton comes with exactly one factor of eta. That's why I designed this object eta. And I refer to eta as the instanton factor. The fact that eta proportional to e to the minus eight pi square over g square is the statement of the instanton action. It's a configuration in the functional integral which has non-zero action. There's a one over g square because everything in the Lagrangian has a one over g square out front, and the action is exactly eight pi square over g square. And it has one unit of topological charge, and that's why it contributes one factor of e to the i eta. So whenever we see an instanton, we just have to throw in a factor of eta. So eta is the instanton factor. And eta has two nc fermion zero modes. Therefore, eta breaks the symmetry, and I'm going to add it to my little table, and claim that eta has charge two nc. So now we are in a situation very similar to what we had in the West Zumino model. We have a global U1 symmetry, and we have a coupling constant eta that transforms under the symmetry. And we can either say that the symmetry is explicitly broken because this parameter has some value because eta is non-zero. Or we could say that the symmetry is still there, but we have to remember to rotate eta as we use the symmetry. The fact that the charge here is 2nc and the basic object lambda is carries charge one means that the symmetry is explicitly broken to 2nc. Now, I've used here the terminology of explicit breaking and spontaneous breaking. Is the distinction between them clear? Known, learned, but you forgot? Or I'll remind you. So explicit breaking is a statement that the symmetry is not really there. We thought it's there, or it's approximately there, but there's something that explicitly breaks the symmetry. Explicit breaking means the symmetry is not there. Spontaneous breaking means that the system has a symmetry, the Lagrangian has the symmetry, the correlation functions, the throw distance have a symmetry, the operators are representations of the symmetry and so forth, but the vacuum is not. So vacuum expectation values do not have the symmetry. If we work in finite volume, the symmetry is preserved. Again, the operators have the symmetry, the symmetry is really a property of the theory, and it can control the dynamics, but the vacuum is not invariant under the symmetry, and therefore vacuum expectation values are not invariant under the symmetry. The breaking of U1R is an explicit breaking. We have a coupling constant that carries the charge. Whenever we have a coupling constant that carries the charge, the fact that the coupling constant is non-zero means that the symmetry is violated. Now I'd like to make a comment about this assumption here. <clears throat> I wrote, the, so the first part of the equation, S is trace lambda lambda, this is just a definition. This was the definition of S. In the second part, I said that the normalization is one. Now, different people might use different regularization schemes, and they will have different values of m cutoff with the same g cutoff, and correspondingly, they're going to get different lambdas. So, lambda is, my lambda could be 100 MeV, and your lambda would be 103 MeV. There's nothing wrong with that. We just have to specify exactly how we define lambda. So, what I'll be using here is a sp specific subtraction scheme known as dimensional regularization bar, sorry, dimensional reduction bar. The details of that are not important. It's just important that we know what we are doing, and this is a very clear 
a subtraction scheme, and it is defined at one loop. So there's nothing fancy, nothing complicated, non-perturbative about it. It is just one loop physics. At one loop, we have to define what we mean by the subtraction scheme. We have to define what we mean by lambda. And the definition we use is a well-known one in the literature, and it's very convenient. One reason it is convenient is that the normalization of the expectation value will turn out to be exactly one in that subtraction scheme. I'm going to derive the normalization later, but at the, mom at the moment when I assume that this is the, normal, that this is the answer and we get something non-zero, I will just say that the normalization is one, and it's one in this particular subtraction scheme. The next comment is that the formula there for eta has nc different branches because we have a fractional power. A, okay, well, which, fractional power which fractional power should we take? We have nc different values for the fractional power, and which of them should we take? And the answer is that we should take all of them. The theory has nc vacua. differing by, or labeled, by the, by the branch in this formula. So we have e to the 2 pi i k over nc, where k goes from 1 to nc. So these are nc different values. What's the physics of having nc different vacua? Well, we said that the system had classically a U1R symmetry that was explicitly broken to Z2nc. The expectation values of two gay genos further spontaneously breaks this symmetry to Z2. Can we break this Z2 symmetry? Any suggestion? Well, let's see what this Z2 symmetry does. This Z2 symmetry flips the sign of the gay genome. Therefore, it's the same as 2 pi rotation. So this symmetry is really part of the Lorentz group. So see the hierarchy of symmetries that we had. We started with the U1R symmetry. It is explicitly broken to Z2 and C. It depends on the number of colors. This just means that the U1R is not a symmetry at all. This is the symmetry of the problem. And this symmetry was further broken to Z2, which is part of the Lorentz group, and therefore it's not going to be broken. Now, I'd like to summarize all this information in an effective Lagrangian because this is the spirit of all these talks. So what can I erase? I need almost everything. So I'm going to write an effective superpotential obtained by integrating out everything. So we integrate out everything. I'll write an effective superpotential. I'll write the formula, and then I'll motivate it. And then I'll make a lot of comments about it. So the comment I'm going, the answer I'm going to write is nc, eta to the one over nc. First, we should check the symmetries. In terms of u1r, notice that this is invariant under the symmetries. I didn't tell you what the coefficient is, but this is invariant under the symmetries because the superpotential should have R charge two. Now, one might wonder, what am I doing? This superpotential is independent of fields, and therefore there is no such object. If you look at Wes and Bagger, they tell you that we can always add a constant to the superpotential. It does not affect the dynamics. That's somewhat too fast. It's too fast for several reasons. First of all, if we couple the system weakly to supergravity, then the value of the superpotential is physical. That's number one, even the number, the constant. Number two is that we can think of this 
tau that we had before, the coupling constant, or this eta as being a background superfield. So we can imagine the gauge theory where the coupling constant has one value here and then it gradually changes to another value over there with wavelength which is a lot bigger than any other scale in the problem. And if we can make it depend on x, we can also make it depend on theta. So if this eta is really a field, then this quantity is particularly, is very meaningful. In fact, in many applications, this eta is a dynamical field in the problem. Usually it comes under the name of dilaton. So this eta is a dynamical field, and therefore it makes sense to integrate out the gauge dynamics and be left with an effective Lagrangian just for the dilaton or just for eta. So this object is perfectly meaningful. There was a question here? No. Second application of this superpotential and which I'm not going to elaborate on, but just to show you that it is physical and meaningful. The system has NC vacua, and therefore we have domain walls interpolating between different vacua. We can have one vacuum very far in this direction, and another vacuum very far in the other directions. And the vacua differ by the branch of the fractional power here, and we can have a domain wall interpolating vacuum number K1, in vacuum number K2. And I'm not going to do it in detail here, but the same thing I said about holomorphy, superpotential, invariant under half supersymmetry, and so forth, applies to domain walls. And if these domain walls are invariant under half the supersymmetries, and in this problem they are, their tension is the value at the first superpotential, at the first vacuum minus the value at the second vacuum, absolute value square. So we can get it from here to be nc, eta to 1 over nc, absolute value, and then e to the 2 pi i, k1 over nc minus e to the 2 pi i, k2 over nc, absolute value. So this superpotential is really meaningful and, and observable and measurable because it gives us tensions of domain walls. Now, if you go back to your quantum field theory 101, we computed the one, uh, we computed the generating function as a function of the coupling constants. Now we can construct what is called there the effective Lagrangian by performing a Legendre transform. We can take the Lagrangian that we found, we view it as a, I call everything a Lagrangian, but this is usually called the generating function because eta is a coupling constant, and as a coupling constant, we can call it, say, view it as a source. And we can compute there some function of the sources, which is the generating function of correlation functions. This is quantum field theory 101, and I'm sure all of you learned it. So the next thing to do is to compute a Legendre transform. Now, if we look at the Lagrangian, the coefficient of s is tau, and tau is roughly the logarithm of eta. So we should do the perform the Legendre transform with respect to log eta. And as we do that, we get two, two interesting quantities. First, s. The expectation value of S is the derivative of W with respect to the source, which is 1 over 3 NC log eta, log lambda, sorry. And that is exactly eta to the 1 over nc. In other words, I've postulated that the expectation value of s is eta to the 1 over nc, and therefore this formula for the superpotential just follows from that expectation value. So this formula, see if you differentiate with respect to log eta, the 1 over nc cancels the nc here, and we are left with the eta to the 1 over nc. 
So we have the expectation value for S. Now we have a derivation of this superpotential. And doing that, we can finish performing the Legendre transform and find W effective of S to be NC S 1 minus log S of the lambda cube. And this is known as the Veneziano Veneziano Yankelovich superpotential. So, what is this superpotential good for, and what isn't it good for? One thing we can say is that if we differentiate that with respect to S and look for the stationary points, we should find the expectation value of S and find the value of the gay geno by linear. We can also substitute the expectation value of S in the different, va in the different vacua and find domain walls. So this is the, the significance of this superpotential. What can't we say about this superpotential? S is not a dynamic, is a <laughs> operator in the theory, but it's not the interpolating field for a light particle. There is no light particle called S. Even more than that, there, even, even, there isn't even a preferred massive particle associated with S. When S acts on the vacuum, it gives us a state, and that state has all sorts of multi-particle states. It's a mess. But it's not a particular particle. So some people refer to this as the effective global superpotential, thinking of S as being the global field. This is good for taking the expectation value, for finding domain walls, but it's not f good for describing the dynamics of any particular particle. Later we will see superpotential, effective superpotential for light modes, and these are meaningful, and they can be used to construct the interactions of light particles. And as a rule of thumb, effective Lagrangians for massless particles are useful and meaningful. Effective Lagrangians for massive particles are a lot more confusing. So that's a good thing to, to keep in mind. So this is what I wanted to say about this pure gauge theory. It has, yes. Right. Uh, that's correct, but we'll see only n because of if you think very carefully about the periodicity of the various fields, then it will give us exactly nc vacua and not an infinite number of vacua. I can refer you to a paper that you wrote on the subject where exactly this, <laughs> where exactly this point was explained. <laughs> It's a good paper. <laughs> <laughs> this was not the main point of that paper. Any more questions? What yes, please. What happened to the R symmetry? In the Excellent. It's not a symmetry. So there are two views on that. One is that the R symmetry is not a symmetry, and therefore it shouldn't be there. Point number two, which I think is actually, uh, well, I'll derive it. Point number two that appears in the literature is we rotate S by a phase. This has R charge two, and therefore it, this has R charge two, and therefore that's taken care of. And if we rotate S by a phase, we see that the Lagrangian is shifted by a term proportional to S, and therefore people said this is a description of the anomaly. The anomaly says that the, symmetry, the Lagrangian is shifted by an anomaly as we do a transformation parameter. I think this is imprecise because we can see that we do, there are other terms in the Lagrangian which are not shifted in an appropriate way. But there's a proper way to say that. And the proper way to say that is to put this NC inside the log. This will also address Edward's question, which would really write things in terms of with NC inside. So since there were really two questions about it, I think I should really give a more complete answer. So there is an NC S, that's the first term. And for the second term, I'm going to write S log of S to the NC over eta. Things should really be expressed in terms of eta rather than in terms of lambda, and then you are, one is never confused about the phases because eta is a good complex number. So 
whenever we start being confused about the branches, that's what we should do. And if we do it this way, you can either say that eta is not rotating, but then the Lagrangian is not invariant under U1R, or you could say that the U1R symmetry is a good symmetry, provided we remember to rotate eta appropriately. And then, indeed, this object is invariant under this R, R rotation, because S has R charge two, and that S to the NC has R charge. Is this visible, or is it kind of squeezed at the bottom of the buck point, or both? So S has R charge two, S to the NC has R charge two NC, and which is exactly the R charge of eta. So this combination is invariant under the U1R symmetry, and therefore this Lagrangian is invariant under the full U1R symmetry, provided we remember to rotate eta appropriately. Any more questions? There was a question around here when I took this one. Sorry? There's a huge literature, and I said I'm not going to give references, so. But, okay, this is explained in, in the paper that Witten wrote with Cachazo and I, sometimes in, some decades ago. I don't remember the date. <laughs> I think it's also explained in the review I wrote with Intrilligator. But the rule to learn from all that is that always, when confused, express things in terms of eta and not in terms of lambda, because now we have a good complex number and the branches, we should account for branches in eta, not in lambda. So it's time to make the theory a little bit more interesting by adding matter. How much time do I still have? Ten to eleven. Okay. So now we'll make the theory a little bit more interesting and add matter fields. So this will be closer to QCD. So we're going to add matter fields in the fundamental and anti-fundamental representation. Of course, we could have added other representations, but we'll start with this one. In the fundamental and anti-fundamental representation. And the rule of the game is that, okay, we first write some super potential for them. So could W will be trace. So Q has both flavor and color indices. And here we contract the color indices to make a gauge invariant quantity. So I'll define M to be Q tilde Q transpose. This one has f only flavor indices. The color indices are being contracted. And M, the must, is a matrix in flavor space. So we contract the indices and then we take the trace to contract the remaining indices. So what this describes in practice is a theory of massive quarks and some SUN gauge theory. So very much like QCD. And I'm going to discuss it in the limit that all the masses are very big. All the eigenvalues of M are much bigger than the absolute value of lambda. And lambda should, will be defined shortly. This would be the QCD scale of the theory. I'm going to study it in the limit that M is very, very large. And again, I'll use the symmetries. So this is the first thing we do when we have such a problem. We make a list of all the characters in this story. We have Q and Q tilde. And we have a meson, which is Q, Q tilde, or Q transpose, Q tilde, U transpose. And we have the mass M. And we have eta, which in this case, it's lambda to the 3NC minus an F. So the one loop beta function is different here, and therefore the exponent is different. And we have a bunch of symmetries. Most of them I'm not even going to write down. We have baryon number symmetry. 
which by convention I take to be one and minus one here, and therefore this is zero, this is zero, this is zero. More interesting is U1A, an axial symmetry that without loss of generality I can take to be one and one here. So if Q and Q tilde are rotated the same way, then M, we just add the charges, we get two, and therefore little m must be minus two. And now comes an interesting thing that here we have two and f. So again, we have instantons, and instantons have fermion zero modes, and each Q and each Q tilde, the fermion in them have a zero mode, and therefore the instanton can be thought of as a vertex carrying charge to an F under that symmetry. So this means that this symmetry is not going to be an exact symmetry of the problem because eta breaks it. We can also consider an R symmetry. And without loss of generality, I'll put zeros here, here, and therefore I have zero here and two here. And it's a little bit more exer exercise to compute the charge here. Now you see that eta breaks both U1A and U1R, so we can consider a linear combination of these two charges that is anomaly free, or a linear combination of these two charges that eta, this vertex, does not break the symmetry. So we have two options, either pick a convenient, uh, this particular linear combination so that we use only symmetries that really exist, or use this basis and use both charges and keep track of factors of eta, and that is guaranteed to do the job for us. So the full mileage, we get full mileage if we use all the symmetries, including the anomalous ones, but we remember that eta carries charges under them. Okay, this can finally go. So we are going to an analyze the dynamics, and the spirit of this will be common in these lectures and also in other things. If you look at principle number three, we should examine various limits. So let's get the answer first in one limit, and then we'll see what the answer is. In fact, we'll get the answer in one limit, and we'll argue that the answer is exact, and since the answer is exact, it's true in for all values of the parameters. This is what we did with the Wesomino model, so now we'll do it with this gauge theory. I'm going to consider it in the limit that m is very big. So I'm cranking the mass up, and at very, very high energies, the theory is asymptotically free. We have some dynamics become strongly coupled, and something happens. Let's see that in more detail. Notice the exponent in eta here. The exponent changes sign depending on 3nc minus an f. When 3nc minus an f is positive, which means that we have fewer flavors, we have asymptotic freedom. Strong dynamics. If 3nc minus an f is less than or equal to zero, we have IR freedom. So to be precise, when there is an equal sign here, the one loop beta function vanishes, but the two loop beta function is negative, so the theory is still infrared free. In this case, the theory is strongly coupled in the UV, and therefore the theory does not strictly make sense, but it's e weakly coupled in the infrared, so in this case it's easy to understand the dynamics because this is what you call WYSIWYG. Wizzy, what you see is what you get. You write terms in the Lagrangian, and that's the answer. The answers are precisely the terms that you see in the Lagrangian. So that's infrared freedom. So let's, but whatever we do, if NF is much bigger than, if M is much bigger than lambda, we can integrate out all the quarks and find an effective Lagrangian and find an effective Lagrangian for the low modes. So what are the light modes? We integrate out all the quarks, 
And what we are left with is only a pure gauge theory. Only gauge fields, no quarks. So we integrate out the quarks, and we found this gauge theory. And this gauge theory we've already analyzed before. Well, we didn't analyze. I stated the answer, but I'm going to use the same answer here. So at very high energies, we have some quarks. In the context of QCD, we can think of this like the top quark. We integrate it out. We come down at lower energies. And now it is as if the top was never there. The only effect of the heavy modes is to renormalize the value of eta, or the scale. So we have threshold as we pass, as we integrate out fields, we have thresholds. That's, that's what it's typically called. And at low energies, we get eta low, which I'll write the answer here, and then I'll explain, can be thought of as lambda low to the 3nc. And that is det m. lambda to the 3 and c minus an f equals that m a. So again, normally you see not this formula, but the logarithm of this formula. And the logarithm of this formula is the statement that at the scale lambda, the sca uh, at the scale m, we integrate out the fields, and the coupling constant starts running differently. So intuitively, Oh, boy. So intuitively, the coupling constant varies as follows. At very high energies, this is energy. So imagine we, are as we have asymptotic freedom. The coupling constant runs like this until the scale around m. So here it runs both under the glue and the quarks. Now the quarks are gone because they're massive. As, as we go to lower energies, the coupling starts running faster. So lambda is defined as the place where the coupling is, say, 1. But lambda low, as you can see, lambda low will be higher. Such calculations are common in physics. The, the beta function changes with energy depending on the fields that participate in the dynamics. And if we do, you put all the two pi's and so forth, you get a formula like that. The only thing that does not follow straightforwardly is the overall normalization, and that depends on the subtraction scheme. So we have this formula. And with this formula, we can just copy the previous answers. So the effective superpotential, it's low energies. We have just SUNC dynamics, and we just copy the previous answers, which was NC, eta low. So we just copy the answer we had before, which we can now write in terms of the original variables. And what is this formula good for? Now, everything I said before about the superpotential is still valid. There are no massless fields. This is not an effective Lagrangian for massless fields. But we can use it to differentiate by differentiating with respect to the sources to find expectation values of chiral superfields. Or if there are domain walls, we can find tensions of domain walls and so forth. So let's do that. This is straightforward algebra. I'll do it here. We have two coupling constants here, eta and m. m is the source conjugate to big M, and eta is the source conjugate to S. So we can just take derivatives and find the answers. So m is d by dm of this W effective, and it is that m eta to the 1 over mc. 1 over m. m is a matrix. 
and a big M is a matrix, and S is expectation value and is D by D log eta So that's good. We didn't have to do any work, and just using our assumption about the pure gauge theory, we found the expectation values in the theory with matter. Now, the claim is that these expectation values, although they were derived in the limit that the mass is very large, although they were derived only in the limit, these formulas are exact. And the way to prove that is, again, use the symmetries in holomorphy. There is no correction that can be written down. So these formulas must be exact. We derive them in one limit, but using the symmetries in holomorphy, they are the exact. And I challenge you to check that both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of these formulas match these quantum numbers. This is almost guaranteed by the way we derive things, but it's good to check it explicitly. So again, we'll make some comments. Again, we have NC solutions differing by the branch of the power here, differing by the branch of the power here. And these NC solutions correspond to the NC, vacu the NC different vacua of the system. Second thing we can do is let's examine the limit M going to zero. When I say M here, I mean all the eigenvalues of the matrix M going to zero. So we derived it in the limit that the masses go to infinity. Let's see what happens as the mass go to zero. And we can take the ratio at different, at different rates, different eigenvalues to zero. That's what I was looking for. So when the number of flavors is less than the number of colors, M runs to infinity, no matter what we do. This is the first thing that looks surprising from this point of view. We have, how come the answer runs off to infinity? Second, for NF, larger or equal than NC, M can be finite. but we get different values. Or various limits. The limit is not unique. So just by staring at this formula, we can derive this result. Notice also that for finite n, that m is non-zero. OK, that's not very surprising. But it is surprising when the number of flavors is much bigger than the number of colors. So when the number of flavors is bigger than the number of colors, the rank of the matrix M is constrained to be at most NC. This is a property in algebra. When you multiply rectangular matrices, the product has a rank which is constrained. That's not true about the answer. If the rank is at most NC and NF is bigger than NC, then the determinant has to vanish, and yet the determinant is not zero. Done or five more minutes? Okay.
So this is something to understand. How did this happen? Well, that's just one second. That is acceptable because the formula m equals q tilde q and using this manipulation about the rank of m is valid for classical fields. Here we have a composite operator. Q tilde q is a composite operator and it has to be regularized carefully and defined carefully. And such a manipulation that reading off the rank of the matrix of the product using the fact that these are individual fields, this is too fast. So this is a good lesson to learn about quantum field theory and we'll see in the lecture tomorrow the underlying reason why this happened. So what we'll do tomorrow is I'll explain how come M, M runs off to infinity here, how come here we can have various different answers and how come we can violate the rank. There was a question here. could be lower, but if it's lower, it was not going to change the fact that the determinant is zero. Yeah, yeah. So whatever the bound is, it's violated, our answer violates the bound. And it could be even smaller, but then it would violate it by even more. So the last thing I want to do is repeat this exercise and compute the Legendre transform based on these formulas. So first we derive the formula in terms of the sources. We found W effective of eta and M and we can compute now W effective of the fields S and M and the formula we find is S, sorry, W effective of M and S is S and C minus an F minus log S to the N C minus an F that M over eta. And I already wrote it here in a nice way that we will not be confused by the branches. And this is again just a Legendre transform. The fact that there is a term linear in S times log eta it's the Legendre transform of that, and I have to add trace little m, big M. The fact that there is a tra term linear in little m is the result of the Legendre transform. And this formula has the property that if we integrate out m and s, namely we take derivatives and set the derivative to zero, we get these as the expectation values. And if we take the expectation val values and substitute them back in here, we derive this superpotential. So if you work in terms of the effective Lagrangian of eta, there's an M like this one, you're never confused by the branches because there's always one over NC and which corresponds to the NC different branches. If you integrate, you write it in terms of S and M, there might be some puzzle here, but again, if you write it in terms of eta, there is no problem. But you can also integrate out S and have a superpotential just for, I'm running out of block points. Block points here are too small. And we can also get an effective superpotential just for M. So we just integrate out S out of here, or alternatively, we start from the beginning and we perform the Legendre transform only for big M. And now we get NC minus an F eta over that m to the power one over n c minus n f trace m m there is a plus sign. Where again here we see different number of branches. So what we'll do next time is revisit the whole theory in a totally different limit. We'll start when the mass is zero. We'll do the whole analysis and we'll see that all these peculiarities that I pointed out here have another way of understanding them in the other limit. And this is something which is very common in dualities. We get the same formula in two limits, but the physical interpretation or the underlying mechanism is different in the two limits. So that's what we'll do next time. And again, I want to stress that 
all these formulas are exact, even though we derive them only in some limit because it follows from those symmetries. Any questions? Oh, it's a fascinating question. Uh, what I said here is not going to change because I'm only considering these local operators. But you can ask, what is the behavior of Wilson lines in this theory? That's a good question. Unfortunately, the answer in this particular theory is not that exciting because in this theory, we have matter fields in the fundamental representation and they can screen the Wilson line. But we can consider other theories, for example, Imagine you put matter fields in the adjoint, or imagine N is even, and you put matter fields in a two-index symmetric tensor, or you studied SON with vectors and you considered Wilson lines in the spinner representation. In all these cases, you cannot screen the Wilson line by the dynamical fields, and then you can ask, what do we know about the behavior of the Wilson line? In fact, you could have asked me this question in the theory without the matter fields when we discuss just the pure gauge theory. In this theory, we have confinement and the Wilson line has an area law. So they have NC vacua and there is area law for the Wilson loop in all of them. And what the tooth loop does in all these things is an interesting topic that I'm not going to discuss here. <laughs> 